Hi, and welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, highlighting artists, teachers, authors, and philanthropeneurs who are committed to planetary purpose. My name is Julian Guderlei, and in today's episode, I'm hosting an interview with David Carr. David is the chief brand cebador of Guayaki Gerba Mate, a company he co-founded with Alex Pryor, his sole brother, in 1996. As the brand steward, David is responsible for the look, feel, and story of Guayaki, including all media, marketing, and retail activities. Guayaki's vision is that Gerba Mate culture will power the market-driven regeneration business model to regenerate ecosystems and create vibrant communities. David is committed to creating sustainable, regenerating enterprises that nourish the planet and humanity. He lives on his community organic farm and retreat center on Salt Spring Island in Canada. And Guayaki has offices all, all across the world, both in British Columbia, Buenos Aires, Jacksonville, and Sebastopol connecting communities worldwide around the culture of Gerba Mate. Led by Spirit, Guayaki remains a privately held company to steward their vision and ensure the legacy. So with these words, really happy to talk to you today. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure. We were just nerding out before we hit record about Gerba Mate because we both have it in our life all over the place. Yes. Tell us the first time you actually connected with, with, with Jerba and Jerba Mate. Like what, what happened for a, a North American kid from California that that, that light went on? Well, uh, like many, I think, founders who are really connected to a product, they had some kind of profound experience with it. And I'm, I'm not an exception to that. I was, well, I really started, I was, at a, I was out at a restaurant having a meal in the Argent, and there was an Argentine guy who was the, the waiter and he spilled food on me. Um, and then we started joking around with each other and then we ended up liking each other. So he invited me out to his, his trailer where he was living on a ranch doing organic farming studies. And, uh, after the meal, he ended up passing around a mate gourd and I had never heard of it before and knew what it was, but I immediately felt it and was like, wow, what is this stuff? So it was, it all started from that, that day. That's, that's exciting. It's like the, the universe made you two collide, like quite literally. So yeah. you did. Cool. Well, you know, and the, the, the big thing for me too was I had profound physiological benefits from the product that I hadn't experienced in my life from anything else. I was one of those allergy victims of hay fever my whole life growing up in California. I was, I was the guy that had like humidifiers in my room growing up for years. And I, was on, I had shots on my arms for almost 10 years to like mitigate the effects of all my allergies and then the prick tests in the back and all that. And it, it helped a bit. And then I was on like Sudafed and Benadryl, took the chemical drugs and they wow. just made me feel pretty bad for years. And so I kind of went cold turkey off chemical medicine around, you know, 1920. I just couldn't handle it anymore. And the only thing that made me feel really good was extreme exercise, meaning where I could breathe. I would, my nose was always running, my head was always foggy, but if I worked out, like if I surfed or mountain biked or did yoga for like at least two hours, I could breathe clearly and my head was clear and I never felt better. So that was my recipe for, you know, feeling good. And, you know, I was, I was, I was in university at the time and that was, I was able to do that. And then when I drank the gourd with Alex that first time, like, I got tremendous relief. Like my nose started clearing up, not perfectly, but like so much different where I could breathe and like my head felt clear and I felt energized. I felt like I just done two hours like a, of a Shtanga yoga or something. Wow. I was like, what is this stuff? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't believe that I felt that good, like within 10 minutes of drinking it. And of course I was drinking the mate gourd, the bombilla stuffed in this huge mass of like, yerba and like i'd never seen anything look look like it i'm drinking it right now and it, it is kind of different for most people but it is kind of different I, for most it people yeah. kind of like green and earthy and i was like i don't care what it tastes like <laughs> this stuff's amazing so i i came to it through like personal regeneration first that's exciting because i feel like food as thy medicine is something that you know it still has quite quite the long journey in front of it that, that like humans across the planet actually see food as medicine and something so simple like the the yerba mate leaf it can definitely like connect you to your stomach in my own experience as well like i i suffered from hay fever myself but it doesn't sound like as intense as you did so so 
Yes. It was just like a clarity for you. I want to be involved with, with this product. This, this herb is incredible. This guy who just spilled food on me, I really like him. It just, it just kind of was following the breadcrumbs at that point. Well, it goes back a little further than that. I had actually left university three years in because I, I had a finance class with a really good professor who was sharing that in our gross domestic product, there was no social or environmental costs. And so my whole world kind of came crushing down on me right then. You know, I was someone who grew up like my mom was probably the first person to recycle in my town, you know, and, and I lived in the beautiful Santa Cruz mountains. And so I grew up with nature and that was really my church, my religion. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in business school, learning that there was no social or environmental costs, you know, I was pretty disillusioned with my own path. And I walked out of class that day, went down to the foreign language institute and said, where can I go? And they're like, I said, I'm done here. And they said, well, you can, we have a program in Southern France. And so I ended up going to Southern France and then staying and then going to Germany and, and learning German and then going to Spain, learning Spanish, which is why I was able to speak Spanish with Alex when I first met him. And so two years abroad, I came back and I was a pretty different person than when I left. Um, it was, I had a chance to kind of recreate myself. And that when I came back was right when I met Alex. So like a year after that, Got it. Yeah. And he, after I was drinking the mate with him, he was telling me all about, well, this product is like from the indigenous people and they live in these forests and they're the stewards of this magical product they consider the most powerful rejuvenator of demand. And so there was just clearly this social and environmental paradigm that was woven into like, Hey, look, if we like, you know, sell the more of this product we sell, the more that we have to grow and the way that we can grow it is in the rainforest. But 90 plus percent of it's all grown and deforested sun ground plantations. My whole country, he's talking in, you know, in Argentine, like my whole country, like Paraguay, mm -hmm. Argentina, Brazil, we all drink sun grown mate. No one even knows where the plant grows. And so the whole industry has grown up around a really unsustainable, destructive paradigm. And, and I was drinking this yerba mate that was grown in the shade of, of the forest that was through a connection from his dad. Um, and it was an experimental project that was started about a decade before I met him to reintroduce yerba mate into its forest environment to, to see if it could generate income to the forest. At the time, they were just sustainably harvesting palmito, like heart of palm, yeah. on this 25,000 acre property. And they, it was, in fact, it was a Canadian um, contingent that suggested they, they try reintroducing this this crop that once was from the forest and they did. And so the first mate I ever tasted was this really smooth tasting shade grown yerba mate that was from the forest. And, and it was this whole incredibly uplifting positive story of like, wow, I can, we can actually sell a product that was from the forest and from the people that could be part of a like, you know, regeneration vehicle to, to bring back the forest and to steward the land and to also empower the people who are doing it. So this is really exciting. I feel like that's over 20 years ago, right? And that's almost 25 years ago. Yeah. And, and yet like the topic of regenerative business, lifestyle, agriculture, you name it, like that's, that's more alive than ever. I feel like we, we haven't taken the cues in the last 30 to 40 years where, uh, you know, our impact into the world's environment and ecosystem is pretty clear, very obvious. We're, we're now reaching this place in our, human story where I think at some point we, we can't deny any longer, even though there's still some, some deniers about our destructive abilities on the planet. So regenerative culture and regenerative uh, business uh, models are, I think, more than ever really needed to play role models for young people, role models for even entire groups of culture or, or societies. And, and so you guys did that and you, you're 25 years, 20 years into that experience and maybe jump forward into the here and now, like on the regenerative front of what Guayaki can create now. I mean, you live on a, on a, um, a retreat center farm on South Spring yourself. Like what are the projects, what are the communities that, that you guys are fostering and supporting? Well, you know, we, we run a, an organic retreat center. And so it's people come here and when they have an experience on the land, the whole idea is connecting people to the to place and on the land so they can kind of ground out and feel connected to something bigger. And part of that experience is really eating 
organically from the land. So most of the food that people eat here, as much as we can source, this comes from our own property. We have a four person uh, woman run farm team and we grow most of our food for the retreat center. So people are eating food from the land, they're walking around on the land and the place is so well cared for and there's so much beauty here that you're sort of taken, you're like, people often are moved to tears, including myself by the beauty. And I think it really takes a bit of a, a personal connection and inspiration for people to make real change in their lives. And so I think that's what happens here in this place. So you that's been here, right? You said yeah, I've been, been, I've been, I've been to the place. Yeah. I mean, I've, um, I've been there for concerts. I've been there for silent retreat. I've been there lots for just like picking up food from the farm stand. I, you know, Salt Spring Island is one of those paradises in, in my life, at least it, um, living in Victoria, British Columbia, it's, it's not too far. It's like an hour and a half commute maybe. And it, it, I already live on an Island, but then where the farm that you're mentioning is, uh, is located, it feels like I'm slowing down even more from regular society speed and which allows me to kind of connect with the church that you mentioned earlier, the, the trees and the, the, the nature, um, energies that are around, you know, uh, because it just slows me down so much to be receptive to it. And kind of let let the monkey mind go. So excellent environment for a silent retreat, I must say. It deeply touched me. And yeah, so well, I, I felt it too. Like when I came to Stole Lake Farm for the first time, I was like really moved by the the beauty and the service. Everyone here is really in service and working the land and the and all the the benefits of that are just come naturally. It's like this natural cycle that happens. Like the more you serve, the more you transform, and the more you transform. The, the more you serve. And we talk a lot about regeneration and, and even Alex himself, uh, my partner, he talks a lot about personal regeneration. I think a lot of regeneration starts out personally. I mean, for me, totally. like drinking Yerba Mate for the first time, I was experiencing some personal regeneration, but then for me, it's really come to this regeneration is more of like a paradigm of thinking. Like there's personal regeneration, there's social regeneration. There's a lot of things that we can do there, which we are doing. There's environmental regeneration, there's cultural regeneration, you know, there's philosophical regeneration, even sort of rewiring your own mind and thinking about things and losing old patterns and stories. And so it feels like we're kind of moving away from this dominant extractive paradigm into more of like a holistic collaborative innovation paradigm where we can, we have the opportunity now, you know, I certainly would love that for my own kids to sort of create a reality that's that's free from a lot of the, the stories that we've, you know, created for them. And, and they can be part of a paradigm that's, that's not one that's been sort of handed to them. Totally. So you never know. I mean, we all come with, we all come with our filters and our dogmas and we're all doing the best we can. And we all have our own set of circumstances. And for me, I feel like I was privileged growing up. I definitely was privileged growing up in the Santa Cruz mountains, of, you know, the mountains of Silicon Valley. And so I had a really interesting lens I was born the year Apple started, you know, and so I saw that whole, you know, wave of technology come and I saw the cherry orchards get, t get cut down and I saw my mom really upset by it all and the Mick mansions made out of drywall, drywall and, you know, plywood castles go up behind our houses and it's just like with two people living in like 12,000 square foot, mm. you know, plywood castles and you're like, that ain't it. <laughs> you know, I get, <laughs> I get the people move here, they're living the dream and they, make a bunch of whatever and they can do whatever they want. I, I wanted to leave that, which is why I went down eh? to San Luis Obispo. I wanted to be near the ocean and the mountains and I wanted to like have an active lifestyle and be in harmony. I didn't want to be in that. And I have no judgment around people to do, but for me growing up in it, I had a different connection to it. And I think that, you know, we, we all come from a different paradigm. Anyway, for me, it was like with privilege comes responsibility. And I felt like I had hundred percent. I love that you're saying that. To do something with what I had seen and where I'd come from, and I still feel that today. Really cool. I 100% on 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 the same page. You know, the the tribe around Green Planet, Blue Planet, and and the the conversations that we often talk about are kind of leaning towards an anti-rival system, a system where you don't need to rival each other and exploit either the Earth or you know each other so there's a winner and a loser but quite the opposite there's a there's a triple win possible right that that you win i win and possibly the entire environment wins and so 
as Boyaki has kind of created its its standing as as like I guess like the biggest Jerba Mate brand in 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 the world at this point, right? Like I I don't know the the numbers of some of the uh, South American um, Mate brands, but it seems like you guys have have created quite the awareness for just a simple plant medicine in a in a drink format. Yeah. What what are some of the projects or movements you guys are supporting? I know there's films that have been created. I know that there's regular events you guys host. Um, yeah. Can you get like a little bit more specific with with Guayaki and like, yeah, I can. If you want to, like, you can point towards the future as well. Like, what is it that that you would really like to see now that that company is like been going for two decades? Well, I really feel like we're an icon for the regenerative movement, and and to live up to that, we need to keep reinventing ourselves as well and and how we are that and what we're doing and because we are a bigger company now and we have more bandwidth and resource so many of the, the things that we're event so many paths that we're venturing down are all centered around regeneration for the longest time it was just so head down and all it was which was great which was you know regenerating rainforest and working with indigenous communities to grow our product and we're seeing all of that amplify now we're seeing more communities want to work with us we're seeing more forest regenerated it's it's in motion and it's happening and so it's really rewarding to see that happen but all of our work has been so far in south america so it's really exciting that now we have a lot more work happening on the social regeneration front in north america with with um, launching our own distribution company we're now we're distributing our own product you know, with electric vehicles and we're hiring people who are formerly incarcerated. We call it the, the Legion of the System Affected, Legion of the System Affected, the LOTSA. So we have, LOTSA. We're, we've hired over a hundred people out of the system and we're getting close to 300 electric vehicles. And we're, I believe we're GM's largest electric fleet customer. And so wow. we're really vertically integrating as many layers as we can and looking at it all through the lens of regeneration. And some of it doesn't make complete sense in the beginning to people on the outside. Like, why would you do that? And it's like, well, we're private. We don't want to sell. We're here for the long term. We love what we do. We have the ability to do more. With privilege comes a responsibility. We feel like we're distributing liquid in aluminum cans, mm. you know, the, there's obviously negative things about that. But one of the things we can do is like, look at how we're delivering it and who we're working with and, and giving people an opportunity who've come out of the, 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 the system, you know, who've been in prison to like work with a, a really positive company and a positive brand is really a, a great work experience that can be a stepping stone for them to another job or they can continue to work with us. But it feels really good to be creating, you know, job opportunities for people that have been marginalized and then to also not be spewing out, you know, more, you know, pollution out the tailpipe as we're delivering our product. And so that's really exciting. And then with, you know, our, our media company come to life, we have the opportunity now to, to shine the, the light on other regenerative projects that are happening. When we were started, you know, like over 20 years ago, it, it was really hard to get any attention for what we're doing. We felt like it was so important, but it wasn't particularly story worthy for whatever reason, but we know how hard it is to like be the pioneer, the leader in something. And so we are because of who we are connected to so many different regenerative projects that are starting out. And so come to life obviously can't cover all of them, but the ones that we're connected to or we find a, a special connection with, we're creating media, you know, film around it to help people get more attention to what we're doing and, and in the process building allies and, and alliances and they, they feel really good about working with us because of who we are and what we do. So those are really exciting things on the forefront right now. That's really exciting, David. I feel like that's the, the, you know, the modern example that's, that's coming up in the show quite, quite a few, a few times in episodes of like creating islands of sanity. So even if it's just a couple hundred people you're affecting, right. Um, through this, um, did you call it LOTSA uh, uh, program of, of kind of bringing people back that were already marginalized in our society. If that is successful as an island of sanity, who knows how far it can carry. But if we don't try it in small islands, it won't, it won't happen. So like- We're dreaming big and we actually, it is working and it's our international expansion model. It's how we're going to take our product internationally is with our, with our own distribution company. And we- expect to hire thousands of people out of the system. That's how we're going to grow and mm. distribute our product. And it's not so much about a number or the size, it's more about 
again, the paradigm of thinking, like, what are we doing? How are we making a difference as a, as a capitalistic, you know, company? Like we are a for-profit company. What, a, what sort of, I mean, that's the whole basis of our business model. Like you read in the beginning, market driven regeneration, the market is going to drive the amount of regeneration. The more that we grow and scale, the idea is the more we're going to internalize costs and regenerate along the way. That's the exciting part of growing not just growing for the sake of say making more money. Totally. So let me ask you a personal question that follows up with that. And it's about optimism. I feel like this world, if you look at it through the mainstream eyes, is still pretty rough to digest at times. And I think all of us know the feelings of, you know, loneliness, anxiety, and depression. They show up every now and then they've maybe shown up in the past. How do you choose optimism in the journey you're on? Well, one of the songs that I wrote last year that I, that I performed with our band and it's on our new album is called Better Tomorrow. And one of the last lyrics in the, in the verses is, I'd rather die a foolish optimist than a righteous pessimist. And it's how I live. It's like, I can't, period. That's a clear stand. I like that. And it is an answer that, that does come up. Like there is a certain naivete or foolishness kind of almost required to always choose optimism. But are we in this journey to be right? <laughs> or are we in this journey to connect for a better tomorrow? Yeah. Hey man, if you could change the education system single-handedly or with a team of people or however you'll do it, what would you do? Well, we start our own school on Stoll Lake Farm for our kids, and it's a small school. It's like we're part of the, the school system as of last year, but for years we ran it independently. And, you know, our kids have only gone to school in a yurt on the farm with, with teachers with about 10 to 13 other kids. And it's pretty nature-based in the sense where they spend a lot of time outdoors, usually barefoot, running around the gardens, but they do have, you know, the, the basic – blocks of reading and writing so we want them to have the tools to to navigate the modern world but it's very student-led and you know with our own children we want them to follow their passions so i think you know we try to expose them to as many things as possible to get any hooks that they can and then really feed that inspiration and passion that they have because i believe and we believe that people will learn things through their own sense of discovery and wonder if they're passionate about it. And not everyone's of course going to be passionate about the same things. So we want to put a lot in front of them, but you know, all of them thrive in a natural environment and whether they're doing these incredible offsite um, treks with, you know, Bryony, who's like an incredible, you know, biologist or all the mentors we've built in so many mentorships into the program and we're just exposing them to all these incredible leaders just in our neighborhood. Cause there's a lot of them on salt spring. So we've created our own system like that. And I, I hope that we'll continue with that over time. It's all I know. Cause I'm just in it for the first time myself. Yeah. Exciting. The, the projects that I've come across that, that I've, featured on the podcast that I love personally, they're all, as you just said, they're all uh, taking nature as a primary teacher, especially for young children and, and, and somehow focusing the learning around uh, like child led, in, um, like being in inquiry, you know? Yeah. Being in inquiry, you know, they, they learn a lot, you know, obviously a, a lot of us have a shared paradigm where like they're going to look at the natural systems and there's a lot of interconnectedness in those systems and why are these birds thriving here and why are these you know what are these ecosystems doing that are working well and they're going to areas where the ecosystems have been damaged and studying it and now they're going to spend this year going to this uh to Burgoyne bay which you probably know where the ecosystem's intact and they're going to be studying the connection that the indigenous people had with the area and so they're we're layering in you know, the connection from the original stewards and like what happened to them and like what's going on now. And there's a lot of lessons that you can, and metaphors that can be taken from the natural environment, as long as the teacher's inspired, right? So you, totally. you have to have an inspired teacher if you're going to have inspired students. And so I think a lot of it comes down to that. And that's what we're doing. 
I'm glad I asked the question. I, I think that's, that's a very exciting, uh, again, like a microcosm, right? Um, I have some more questions about the, like, the, the, the visionary um, inside of you, right? And you said it a few times in this episode, with great privilege comes great responsibility. Just with privilege comes responsibility. And I, I really, I really like agree. I think privilege is what it is in a world that doesn't yet work for everyone. And so there comes the responsibility to, to, to create a world that works for everyone. Yeah. Specifically for British Columbia, you've been living here how long now? 15 years. 15 years. Kind of double, double to me. I've been living here seven to eight years. Yeah. So my sense is British Columbia is largely a pretty wild place still. Yes. And with Vancouver and Victoria, that whole like larger agglomeration, Vancouver Island, the Gulf Islands, there is a natural diversity that not every place has anymore on this planet. And at the same time, we have an influx of people. We have more people wanting to come here as tourists, as, as visitors, but also to live. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I do think it's exactly the same story again. This privilege turns into a responsibility because British Columbia could be one of the world's cutting edge innovators in how to create society integrated into nature. And so I want to ask you, like, what, what do you see there? What are, what are, what are projects that are already embodying that? I mean, Stowe Lake Farm obviously is one, we already mentioned it. And what are maybe things you, you, you'd hope British Columbians and, and, and us as a community are creating? Well, it's, it's a good, fair question. And I, and I don't feel totally qualified, you know, amongst compared to a lot of people I know to, to comment on it, but I, I feel like British Columbia is also very, has like a reputation as like British, beautiful British Columbia. And it is, but it's really extractive as a, as an industry. And it's, there's not a lot of protections. And I think a lot of people are really fighting, you know, with good reason to protect what's left, you know, the orcas are dying, like all the last, icons of this of this area are mm. are fading and, and it's it's i think it's only lasted as long as it has because there hasn't been that many people but it's always been very extractive based as an economy and so you have a lot of a lot of entrenched dollars and old money holding it to the old paradigm and that's what everyone's fighting against when i think everyone here actually really does love the beauty and everyone does want it to stay the same but i think a lot of those people are the same people that have maybe their assets or their investments still invested in extractive paradigms, which are very damaging to the environment. So I think a lot of people are kind of caught in that, like, what are they supposed to do? Where are they supposed to put their money? Because a lot of it is in that. And you know, I think that it's, it's, it's really inspiring to see a lot of young leaders and people speaking out about what's important. I think that's really what needs to happen. I think we need to have more like, um, peaceful protest, which I think we're having, but yeah, it's, it's real. I mean, it's sad to hear about the baby orcas dying because mm. they don't get enough salmon. And yet we're still, we're still talking in 2019 about the destruction around fish farming. And you're like, are we still really talking about this? Seeing fish come out with two heads and like three eyes. And it's still happening in some of the most pristine remote areas. And the government allows it, you know, the, the wealthy invested mm. interests allow it. It's just happening. So it's, it's a little hard to see that in an area that is still one of the last sort of bastions of incredible nature. You know, most seems, of Vancouver Island has yeah. been logged, you know, and they're still yeah. they're like, I heard a couple of years ago, they're in there logging Carmana. And it's like, they are, yeah. how are you, how can you justify right now? I don't care what, it is. I don't know what, what reasonable justification. I don't know how I could explain to my own kids. Mm. Like if I was like how I was logging the last giant cedars mm. protected for it. Like how would, who could explain that to someone they cared about or loved? Forget about mm. the world or the environment. You know, just how do you, how do you justify something like that to anyone other than just yeah. purely financial? And then go out like another generation or two, right? Like imagine your children's children's children and they'd look at you and be like, yo, great, great grandpa, David, like what the fuck did you guys do there? Like, 
yeah, he I, makes just no sense from who we are. Yeah. No, you know, and I mean, yeah. 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 So this is my, my key question, David. Yeah. This is my key question. Like what's, what's your earth vision for a seven generational view? Like if we were to go 200 years out and we include seven generations, which usually is about 210 years. And we say we would actually create a paradigm that is regenerative and we are creating a paradigm that, I mean, this happens to be the philosophy of the native uh, and indigenous people around the planet as well. Um, but but a, apart from it being their traditional way of thinking, it's, it yeah. just seems to make so much sense because it, it creates a view larger than the ego. It doesn't matter what Julian or David want for their McMansion at that point. It, it just matters because that McMansion is around what, like one or two, maybe three generations. Those legacies don't live forever. But if we had a legacy for the planet, and I know you and you have one, and I know Guayaki has one, um, share a little bit of that dream. Like, what becomes possible? What What do you see are the essential pillars of that? Well, like I said, you know, I'd rather die a foolish optimist. So I, I believe we need a revolution in consciousness, and the only way that's going to happen is if there's a lot of inspiring things going on, which there is. And I feel like I'm tapped into a lot of those things. So I'm I'm really inspired to see all the things happening. I mean, you know, we were like one of the founding members of B Corporation when there was like 25. Mm -hmm. Now there's over 2000 companies that are actually thinking about more bottom lines than just financial, but it's not, that's, that's a still a very small percentage of companies. So, you know, I think that really our hope rests with, with the youth and we focus most of our time connecting with the youth because they're the ones who are going to inherit it. And I feel like, unfortunately, it's going to require a bit of die off of the old paradigm. And it's just a matter of time before the youth who are coming up, they're, they're being raised with a different sense of awareness and a different type sense of connection. We're only just talking about reconciliation now with the First Nations people, but that's a long process. And there's just a, it's a lot of it. Even like with, I see it like with the Ashe Guayaki, who we work with in Paraguay, there's a lot of heaviness with the parents, you know, who have witnessed the genocide that the Guayaki people experienced when they're, they were killed because they needed to be so they could cut down the forest and grow GMO soy. You know, it's like, but the kids are bright and spirited and happy and they don't know that paradigm as intimately. And now they're growing up with with Guayaki as their partner with us. And like, they have a drying facility and a school in their property. And now there's housing and water systems and food sovereignty. And so their paradigm is more of a regenerative paradigm. But of course, this stuff isn't going to take place in a year or two. It's going to take place in decades. And so this regenerative paradigm is sort of the paradigm that we're going to be living through, I think, over the next, well, from here on out, but really going to be kicking in over the next decades. And that's what gives me optimism is that it's, it's started, it's gaining momentum. People like yourself are switched on and care about it and are talking about it. And it's what's going to take. I don't think there's that many people in the older generations that are going to let go that easy of things that are just sort of entrenched. And it's like mm. you have $30 billion of invested capital in like a million operation that's spewing, you know, fumes in the air and relying on like a pretty unsustainable practice that at one point was quite profitable and made a ton of sense because there's all kinds of trees and it's not the same. You kind of just need to like, I understand how, why people need to depreciate their assets and why things take a while to like switch over. At the same time, you know, I think the, the impending climate crisis might be, be actually being a catalyst to bring us together, just like, you know, President Trump has been a catalyst to like bring people more together. So I feel like, you know, we're going through this polarized time and then eventually Very much, yeah. as we move through the polarization, it's going to become more and more clear that like, look, you know, some of the best things in life are free mm. <laughs> and, yeah. and we need to be connected. And, you know, when people are, when people experience connection and they're in their heart and they're sharing simply a good meal together you know, or passing around a mate gourd or playing music together or like taking a walk through the forest. Like those things are some of the more incredible things that you can do in life, not necessarily affording the next, the next McMansion or your second one or your third one or your fourth one. <laughs> I don't know. People have different people, different things flow at different people's boats. But I, I think that, you know, 
the younger people growing up are learning that the earth is a smaller place and we all live here and we all kind of got to get along and we all all these different eco regions are kind of connected all over the world and there's sky rivers and there's earth rivers and it's it's not uh you know it's not my house and my white picket fence and my two car garage with, with my two cars you know that's a different paradigm beautiful answer thank you so much for elaborating on that for for a bit there um, i have a last question for you and it, it's just like a very pragmatic question oh, yeah? when, okay. it, when it comes to you know you've been 20 25 years on that journey with guayaki imagine david who's talking to me right now could talk to david from 25 years ago what would be like one two three things that you learn now where you're like yo younger david listen <laughs> <laughs> this and this and this you should really know oh you know probably just to be more patient you know and always be more in the heart and be a better listener you know i was classically one of those driven entrepreneurs who was single-minded and like i could work i could out do anything like I never tired I was drinking mate and you know <laughs> actually slow down and take some time and and reflect and, and allow more you know rather than needing to do everything myself you know mm. but I don't know I'm kind of the same person I'm still a bit that way but I, I I try to like be more of a better listener and breathe and take time out to reflect yeah, man. I think, as you said earlier, those are those are like processes of decades, right? We, what's the rush about? Like, you don't need to learn all that in twenty four hours. Like, I mean, maybe someone can, but they're like real experiences with real other humans. And I mean, listening, creating space for hearing. Um, I find it interesting. That's being shared a lot on that show, and it's being shared a lot in all the social circles I'm in. And I feel like. This is uh, our relationship with the earth and with the indigenous cultures and the other uh, paradigms around. It's the same thing. If we can create a deeper space of listening, we might, we might see answers that aren't visible as long as we're still holding on to our uh, trains of thought, you know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and humility, you know, I think comes with that too as you, as you age. It's just like, I feel like I learn, I'm still learning so much and I'm actually learning more all the time and uh yeah it's it's exciting I mean if, if you're in a I think if you're in a, a place where you're personally or professional or aligned you have that experience where you're always kind of being challenged and inspired to learn more and there's always so much more we can learn about how things are interconnected it's pretty it's pretty fascinating process Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, David. Is there anything else you'd like to shout out? Anything that's coming up that you want to mention? Um, anything where people can find you? Um, you know, the, our, we're, we'll be down in LA the month of October doing a lot of events, connecting people in different communities. That's, that's, what, that's what we do now is we're trying to um, create allies and partnerships with like-minded individuals and organizations. And so that's taking place in October. But more than anything, thank you for taking the time yourself. And I appreciate you sharing the story and appreciate you showing up. Appreciate the, appreciate you caring. Thank you. Right back at you. That was a, that was a great 35, 40 minutes for me. Cheers.